Hey everybody, uh, I know that I'm at the meeting this morning, but I'm also at home right now, uh, sitting with my friend David Campbell, who comes to us from Stratford, Ontario. So I was just talking to David, he's going to be sharing with us uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. So we're looking, this is the third week in Isaiah, we've already looked at an intro that John did with us a couple weeks ago, and Dave last week from Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 6, where he is called, you can find both of those on the website, both those audios. But today, uh, we're looking at what would be called maybe one of the Christmas passages, uh, the Messiah early in the book of Isaiah. So I thought, who who could I ask to uh, tackle one of these passages? And David came to mind. So I was trying to think how long we'd known each other. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years uh, since he got involved in the churches that we we're involved with in Indiana. And other connection points, though, he has uh, eight children, nine grandchildren, five of which live in England. And I believe the first churches you planted were also in England. Is that correct, David? Up in Durham. You know, up in Durham. So many connections. In fact, he was just here last month. Um, travels quite a bit, preaches all over and teaches all over the U.S., Canada and the UK as well. He'll be in Phoenix, uh, probably when we watch this in the searing heat, something well over 30 or 35 Celsius. So it's great to have you with us, David. And I'm simply going to turn it over to you. In fact, I'm even going to make the screen just you. So everybody doesn't have to watch me watch you. And um, look forward to hearing what you have to say to us from Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. I'll pray and then it's all yours. So Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this Sunday when we can once again look at this fascinating book of Isaiah and the prophetic words throughout it, the foretelling of the Savior, of the servant, of the Messiah. And we ask that you would use David this morning here as he speaks to us on a Tuesday night, but we're watching it on a Sunday morning thanks to technology. May we all learn, may we all grow, and not leave here unchanged. In your name I pray, Father. Amen. So it's all yours, David. Thanks, Earl. And, uh, well, good morning, Overton. It's good to be with you uh, electronically, if not in person. And uh, let me just start by reading these two verses uh, from uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, in the first few, I'm sorry, in the first five verses of this chapter, Isaiah has prophesied concerning a future victory for God's suffering people. He says in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And uh, in Hebrew, that's called a prophetic perfect. What that means is that the prophet uses something in the past tense uh, to refer to something that hasn't happened yet. But he's so certain of it happening, he re refers to it as if it's already happened. Um the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, verse 2. And then verse 5, the victory will be complete. Even the clothes and the oppressing forces will be fuel for the fire. And the reason for this victory is given in verse 6, for to us a child is born. A child is to be born who will bring deliverance to Israel. To speak of the birth of this child, as I said, Isaiah uses this Hebrew prophetic perfect tense, the, a past tense which speaks of a future event. A child has been born. The significance is, uh, as I said, that the future prophecy is so certain of fulfillment, he can speak of it as if it had already happened. So 700 years before the birth of this prophesied child, Isaiah, Isaiah declares for to us a child has been born, is born, has been born. It's a past tense in Hebrew. Now, God created the world just by speaking. In Genesis, it says, and God said. And so when God speaks, it's not merely a prediction or a forecast. It's his creative word of power, which carries within it, within itself, its own fulfillment. 
Never underestimate the power of God's word. When we take for ourselves the promises of God's word, we enter into their power. Our words have no power, but God's words do. And we need, of course, to line ourselves up, to line our lives up with the word of God. If we want to inherit its promises, we can't just go to God and ask for anything we want. But uh, And so when we come to God as our provider, the question is, are we honoring him in our finance? When we come to God as our protector, are we engaging in foolish or reckless or disobedient activities? But if we line ourselves up with the word of God, God's words have all power. Jeremiah puts it this way in chapter one. He says, I watch over my word to perform it. So the past tense of the verb also emphasizes the fact that the fulfillment of the prophecy, in this case, the birth of the promised child, will take place at a definite time in history. It's a one time event that is going to occur. God's promises enter into this world of darkness and doubt and make him real and manifest in the midst of the darkness. He will intervene in the flesh and blood existence of our daily lives. That's the God that we serve. We can take hold of the promises of God. He offers us more than vague philosophies. He brings who he is into this world to change it. Hebrews chapter 1 states that when Christ came into the world, he came as the exact imprint of God's substance, of the reality of who God is. That word imprint refers to the image on a coin, like the image of the Roman emperor on a Roman coin. Um, it's the exact likeness of the one pictured. And the word substance refers to the very reality of who God is. So when Jesus, this child that Isaiah is prophesying, when he was born for us. He brought the very substance of God himself into this fallen world, and he did so in a way that exactly mirrors and reflects who God is. When the child was born, God came into this world, not a likeness of God, not a shadowy image, not someone who had some of God's characteristics, not a good man or a moral teacher or a wise philosopher, but God in all his substance and reality. That's what makes Christianity so different from any other religion that has ever existed. God did not send a representative. He came himself. When you looked at Jesus, you saw that exact representation. You saw God. And then Isaiah continues, for to us a son is given. Um, well, if he's a child and he's male, surely he's a son. But there's more meaning to it than that. Uh, he's the greatest son ever born. Since the days of the psalmist, God's people expected the Messiah to be the son of God. And that's what Isaiah is pointing us toward in this statement. Uh, if we go back to Psalm 2, um, it reads, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So this is God speaking to Jesus. And uh, the psalm gets quoted in the New Testament, including the book of Revelation, as fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. To us a son is given. Into this glorious picture of a father and a son, God the Father and God the Son, into, into it we enter as brothers and sisters of that son by divine adoption, all joined in relationship to the father, the son, and to one another through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Because Jesus came as a son, and we're his brothers and sisters, that makes us family. As a son, also, he understands our struggle. He's walked through it, Hebrews says, but without sin. And it's all for us. In chapter 7, Isaiah told us the name of the child will be Emmanuel, which means simply, God is with us. So to us, a son is given. All of this is baked into that promise, the um, relationship that he's drawing us into with God the Father and with one another in adoption, making us family. And then it says the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
His kingdom is a kingdom of grace, but it's also a kingdom of power. Jesus said it himself, all power is given to me, Matthew 28, verse 18. The whole world becomes subject to the rule of this child. He will rule the nations, the psalm says. God's kingdom is not a theory or an idea. It's the exercise of his power and his authority. N nor is God's kingdom a place. It is, th it is the exercise of his authority through his people. And then as we come to a list of his names, of the names of the child. Now in the Bible, a name indicates something about the essence of a person, their identity, who the person is. So the, these names are interesting because they describe who the child, the prophesied child is. It starts saying his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The first word, wonderful, is actually a noun, not an adjective. It's, it's literally, he's to be called a wonder, a counselor. Now, our word wonderful, uh, even in ink, modern English, has lost its original significance. It has come to mean something unusual or extraordinary or something bringing happiness, but it's not very much a human phenomenon. But the Hebrew word, however, is the one used to describe the incomparable, the impossible, supernatural wonders God did in bringing his children out of Egypt. Psalm 78 says he performed wonders in the land of Egypt. And that meaning is carried through into the New Testament phrase, signs and wonders. So the old English meaning of wonder is a miracle. He is, it's not just something that's interesting or amazing or unusual. It's a miracle of God. And this child is to be a miracle of God, a wonder. A wonder has to do with God. The child is to be a wonder. He surpasses all human understanding. As we hear these kind of names, we realize we're being introduced by the prophet to God himself. The child to be born is God in the flesh. Isaiah understood that so far as he could understand it, 700 years before Jesus was born. And of course, he understood a few other things. If we read into the 52nd and 3rd chapter of uh, his book, um, he describes quite accurately the suffering of Christ and his work of saving us from sin. But in this particular list, getting back to our text, uh, Isaiah, oh, sorry, in this particular text, all the other names in the list are defined by the first one, which is wonder. He is a wonder. He is supernatural, miraculous in nature, and it that defines everything else that is about to come. But secondly, he's counselor. So Isaiah tells us that the spirit of wisdom and understanding will rest upon him in chapter 11. The Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 tells us that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Every other king or ruler on earth is surrounded by counselors, but this king needs none of them. He himself is counselor. Now, we live in a day when more information exists than ever before. The rate of increase seems to be exponential. But equally, we live in a day where the foolishness of human wisdom has rarely been more openly displayed in all the foolish and self-destructive ways that our culture is operating. But this child to be born is counselor, and him is the wisdom of the ages. And if we think Google, Microsoft, Adam, I'm sorry, Apple, quantum physics or artificial intelligence have something better to offer than Jesus. We are the greatest fools who ever lived. And he will be called mighty God. Isaiah tells us that in the future, the faithful remnant of Israel will return to the mighty God. Chapter 10, that this child is the mighty God. Mighty is the word for hero. This is the hero God the God who is a hero. If we think of Jesus as meek and mild, we've under, misunderstood the biblical meaning of those words. Uh, in Greek, those words refer to a strength so incredibly powerful, it willingly submits 
to the worst forms of suffering. It's power under control. That's what it means when it talks about Jesus being meek. Uh, when that child hung on a cross, he was not feeble or weak. He was on the cross by his own decision, controlling the course of history, even as his physical strength was draining away. But now, raised by the power of God, he rules the universe by the word of his power. He is the mighty God, the greatest hero who ever lived. We don't need any role model other than Jesus. Uh, even we, we don't need all the imaginary characters of fiction that we look up to to inspire us or real life hero figures. We have the mighty God in our midst. Christianity is, is not intended to be a place of celebrity culture. The only celebrity is Jesus. He is the mighty God. And his kingdom, we know, thankfully, for all of us is a kingdom of grace and of love. But let no one forget, he is still the man who cleansed the temple, who faced down the Pharisees, who reduced the Roman ruler to silence, who stilled the storm, who walked in the water and who raised the dead. He is our hero. And he is, Isaiah tells us, everlasting father. Although he is the son, the closeness of his relationship with the father allows him to reveal the father to men and women. Now, every psychologist in town will tell you that there is a severe crisis of fatherhood in our uh, culture. And uh, I think that feminism has had the unintended side effect sometimes of letting men off the hook. If women can do what they want, then men's response is, well, we don't need to provide security, financial provision. We don't need to lay down our lives. It's an is a wrong excuse, but it's real in our society. And uh, very rarely when there's broken marriages, do you find the men are left looking after the kids. It's almost always the women. And so a generation has grown up without an understanding of fatherhood in large measure. It's frightening the number of children and young people that have been raised without an understanding of fatherhood. Well, this child to be born still reveals the father. And one of the greatest tasks of the church today is to allow who the father is in Christ to reveal himself through us. And in the process, um, uh, speaking as a man, to call man up, back up to their God-given responsibility of reflecting his fatherly image to their families and to the culture in which they live. He is everlasting father, and he is, finally, the prince of peace. Unlike earthly rulers, he seeks the greatness of his kingdom, not in war, but in peace. Now, peace, biblically, the word does not mean the absence of conflict. It more refers to the resolution of conflict, by a presence that comes in. Jesus brought peace between God and man through what he did. Uh, he resolved the conflict and he brought uh, a state of, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It means wholeness, where everything is just right. But to do that, Jesus had to satisfy the righteous and holy anger of God against our sin by the sacrifice of his sinless self. And by doing it, he created this peace, this shalom, this wholeness, this health, this life that can be lived as God meant us to live. It's, it's more than just peace as opposed to war. It's health and joy and provision as opposed to want and brokenness and sorrow. Peace in the world can only come where there's resolution of conflict. And that comes only when the cause of the conflict is removed. The cause of all conflict ultimately, as we know, is human sin. And the child that is to be born, he's the only one who can remove that problem. Peace in a worldly sense 
is certainly better than war, but it usually turns out to be a temporary solution. More wars, we witnessed that recently in various places, more wars have been fought in the last hundred years than in all history before. The peace process, particularly in the Middle East, has been going on for 50, 60 years. And look how little has been achieved. The only true peace is that which comes through Christ. And so the passage concludes, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This government of God advances through peace, not war. That's why the more the church is persecuted, the greater it thrives. Small churches led by Western missionaries and put through the fires of persecution become great movements of millions in other parts of the world. And the amazing thing is, the leaders of the next generation in the body of Christ are those who have been reached by past generations of missionaries, those who have suffered the most, not white Westerners, but the Chinese, those from Muslim nations, Koreans, Africans. Um, my friend uh, Franklin Piles was uh, president of a denomination, an evangelical denomination called the Christian Missionary Alliance in Canada. And when the communists took over uh, Vietnam, the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance had um, a number of churches, 100 or 200 churches. They had about 30 or 40,000 people that had been won to Christ. It was a major mission field for them. And when they were thrown out, all they knew was that all the pastors were thrown into jail. Some died. Uh, years went past, and the country began to open up again about 20 to 25 years later, to the point where uh, he and a number of other leaders from that denomination were invited back and allowed to go back to Vietnam. As a, they went with great fear and trepidation. What are we going to find? Is there anything left? Well, there was. They found untold numbers of churches with an estimated one million people in them. The seminaries were full to overflowing. The students were standing because there wasn't any seats in the seminary classrooms. It's amazing what God can do. 1,600 years or so ago, maybe 1,700, if got my history right, uh, the Christian leader Tertullian uh, was correct when he said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. God's kingdom is established not by force, oppression, tyranny, or even democracy. It's established by justice and righteousness, the justice and righteousness of the child who rules it. And his kingdom is eternal. Luke, Daniel tells us, um, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And Luke tells us he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forevermore and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And now this kingdom through Jesus, the prophesied child, has come to earth. The zeal of the Lord, Isaiah says, will do this. In the Bible, God's zeal expresses both his intense love for his people and his unswerving goal of asserting his place as God. His zeal is a determination driven by his great love, and nothing will stop him. The government of God will be established by the will of God. He enlists us as his co-workers, and our role is so important. But if we don't respond, he'll find somebody else. And our confidence is this, that whatever we do, in the end, it doesn't depend simply on our own efforts, but on his grace, his power, and his zeal. What is our role? Our role is to say yes. Lord, use me however you want. 
while the child that was born in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy now is reigning on the throne of heaven. He is our hero. Today is not soon enough to follow him. Maybe you're listening to me and you've never made that commitment to Christ. Today is not soon enough to follow him with everything you have. I invite you into it a great adventure of faith today. And if you're already in it, then just keep on, go deeper. Uh, don't hold back. Uh, live a life of faith. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K, but God will never fail you. Your reward will be to see his kingdom come, as Isaiah says, in justice and in righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. God bless you, and thank you for the privilege of sharing his word with you today. Amen. Well, thank you, David. Um, no wasted words there. <laughs> there is a lot to uh, to dissect. Hopefully, all of us listening have had our iPads and pens and pencils, whatever you might take notes on, out handy, because there is a lot to jot down much to think about. Uh, thank you so much for dissecting those two verses, pulling out the meanings of the names. Uh, wow. And, and the story from Vietnam from 30,000 to 1 million. Um, Tertullian was definitely correct, wasn't he? he was. Well, thank you for taking the time out. I know you're a busy guy. I know you've been working on loads and loads of uh, different teachings, but uh, to pull that one out for us has been a real treat. Have a wonderful time as you head to Phoenix this weekend and whatever else you do throughout the rest of this week as well. Thank you. All right. We'll stop the record there. <laughs>